Tonight on this Easter Sunday, we're going to take you to a place outside our world. It's not Mars or Venus, but it might as well be. It's a remote peninsula in northern Greece that millions believe to be the most sacred spot on Earth. It's called Mount Athos, and prayers have been offered here every day with no interruption for more than a thousand years. It was set aside by ancient emperors to be the spiritual capital of Orthodox Christianity and has probably changed less over the centuries than any other inhabited place on the planet. The monks come here from all over and do everything they can to keep what they call the world far away. Not surprisingly, journalists are not exactly welcome. For more than two years now, we've been corresponding, negotiating, and frankly pleading for an invitation, but ran into one monastic wall after another. Then, much to our surprise and delight, a few months ago, the monk said, okay, come see who we are. The story will continue in a moment. This Byzantine cross marks the border between Mount Athos and the 21st century. The monks come here, as they always have, for the beauty, the tranquility, and the isolation. But most of all, for this. Father Yakovos is one of the few Americans on the mountain. He's been here more than half his life. You have to understand the words that we're saying in today's liturgy are the same words that Christ was saying, the same words that saints from the first century, the second century, the third century, the fourth century. And nothing has changed in Orthodoxy since then. It's the only branch of Christianity that can make that claim. Father Eliseos is the abbot the top man, at Simonos Petrus, one of the 20 monasteries. It was Abed Eliseus who invited us here, and never let us forget what a rare privilege it was. It happened once, in 1981. <laughs> the, last, the last time you invited a television crew here was 1981. Correct. We weren't going to invite you, but your persistence convinced us to open the door. The door he opened revealed the wonder that is Simona's Petrus, which fits like a crown on top of a rock 800 feet above the Aegean. It was built in the 14th century, and the monks will tell you it must be considered a miracle that it hasn't fallen into the sea. There are 20 monasteries on Mount Athos. Some look like medieval fortresses. Others are so large they resemble small cities. They rise from virgin forests and line the coast, shrouded in mist. There's nothing on this 130 square mile peninsula other than monasteries and monks. Nothing. We expected Mount Athos to be a quiet place, but we couldn't have imagined how quiet until we were dropped off here. The silence is only broken by the occasional tapping on a chiseled piece of chestnut. It's a call to prayer, and it started being used here before there were bells. The monks here have one goal, and that is how to get closer to God. Father Serapion wanted us to understand that there is no place on earth closer to heaven than Mount Athos. Every day, a thousand divine liturgies are celebrated on the peninsula. It's unique in the world and in the Orthodox Church. Exactly what makes it unique? It's the absolute way of life of the monks. It's a Spartan way of life, but all the monks we talked to said they never want to leave not even for a day. So they try to be self-sufficient. They grow their own fruits and vegetables, do their own tailoring, and when they get sick, there's an in-monastery doctor, Father Emileos, 
who's not very busy because the monks are in excellent shape. There's remarkably little cancer, virtually no heart disease or Alzheimer's. They must be doing something right in addition to drinking wine at nine in the morning. They eat two meals a day. There's what they call the first meal, which lasts 10 minutes, and the second meal, which lasts 10 minutes. There's no meat and no dinner table conversation. The only sound, a monk reading from sacred texts. We were surprised by how busy the monks are. When they're not praying, they're working. Father Theodosius, born a Lutheran in Germany, is a mechanical wizard who has given the monastery continuous electricity and occasional hot water. Many Christians in the world, they are, they are looking for, for the original church, you know, for, for the ancient church. Do you think this is the closest to the original church? Yes. Mm. When you come to Orthodoxy, you will see it, it has everything you ever sought for. Father Averkios takes care of the ancient footpaths here. He clears the trails. We went with him on what was for us an exhausting hike on the hills above the monastery. It wasn't tough for him, though. He says that after decades of roaming the world, this is his path. I've been to many places. Tell me where. Uh, from Switzerland, of course, from Sweden, Finland, Spain, Portugal, Singapore, Australia, and uh, uh, Texas. Texas? How did you like Texas? I liked very much. I liked mostly the people. Now, with all the traveling you've done, how did you end up here? I was searching for a way of life. I can give all of myself to that. And I think the God of Jesus is above all the others, money, lifestyle, even family. The family at Simonas Petrus consists of 54 monks from eight countries. Father Yakovos came here 25 years ago from Winthrop, Massachusetts. This is about as beautiful as it gets. I think so. He took us on a tour of the monastery. It would be tough enough to build a monastery on top of a rock today, but how did they do it in the 13th century? You know, that's something which even modern-day architects are amazed at. When the workers came and saw the site where St. Simon, the founder of our monastery, wanted to build, they looked at him and they said, You're crazy. Are you crazy? <laughs> of course. So being crazy was not a bad thing? No, not at all. Now, back then, how did you get stuff up here? We have mules. It takes 15 minutes to walk through the monastery into the sunlight. Enough time to find out that Father Yakovos's journey to Mount Athos started at the age of six when his father showed him a picture. It was just so impressive and I turned around and I said to him, Dad, you know, I don't think that I'm going to be able to believe that somebody lives in that building until I step on those balconies myself. Destiny. It is a little bit. Too. From the age of six. Yes. Father Yankovos doesn't follow what's going on in Winthrop or anywhere else today. There are no newspapers, no radio, no television on Mount Athos. There are a few telephones, and Father Yankovos got a call last year. His father was dying. Prior to his death, he was asking if I would go so I could see him one last time. Reasonable request. From a father, I think so. My response was negative, though. You didn't go? I didn't go. I didn't go because of the fact that monastics do not go to funerals of their relatives or their friends. They remain here at the monastery. When your father asked you to come see him one last time, and you said no, was there any feeling of I'm letting my father down? Not at all. I know that we're going to see each other in paradise one day. The whole idea at Mount Athos is not only to isolate oneself from the outside world, but to let go of all memories of one's past life. The purpose of your being here, as I understand it, is prayer without distraction. I'm not being distracted now. <laughs> why, why are you laughing? First, first, tell me why you're laughing. Why am I laughing? Because... St. Paul says we're to pray unceasingly. What's funny about that? That's not what's funny about it. What's funny is how you think I can stop praying. You're praying 
Every minute of the day. Even right now when we're talking. Really? Of course. You don't see Father Yakovos praying while he's talking, but look at these other monks. Their lips never stop moving, not for a second. They just keep reciting the Jesus prayer day and night. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. It becomes like breathing. Some monks say they can pray when they sleep, and they get no more than three hours sleep a night. But Mount Athos gets more applicants than it can handle. It's harder to get into than Harvard. The man comes as a novice, he's free to leave if he doesn't like it, and the monks can tell him to leave if they don't like him. When a novice arrives here, can you tell whether he's going to make it or not? Can you tell whether he's going to qualify to be a monk? After a while, it becomes pretty obvious whether or not someone is cut out for it, which is why we have a trial period, which can last up to three years. I bet you know a lot sooner than three years. Certainly. Once he's accepted into the community, it's a lifetime commitment, and life never changes here. Never. Every day at three in the morning, a single bell rings, informing the brothers that it's time to stop praying on their own and start praying in church. On a typical day, and every day is a typical day, the services last eight hours. The monks say it's an eight-hour conversation with God, a dress rehearsal for eternity. And remember, this doesn't only happen on Sundays, it happens every day, 365 days a year. A monk never gets a day off. This is the Divine Liturgy, the life of Christ celebrated by men whose only passion is to move closer to Christ every day. The depth of their devotion defies description. They didn't look like the same monks we had met in the gardens and the workshops. They were utterly transformed, with a concentration so profound they were immune from distraction. There were occasional flashes of ecstasy. This old monk could have risen out of a Rembrandt. <laughs> There are no musical instruments in the church, just chanting, chanting without end. Many of the voices, the basses in particular, could have made it at the Met. We didn't understand the words, we didn't really have to. This phrase we knew. Lord, have mercy. The most miraculous thing about Mount Athos may simply be the fact that it's still there. Over the centuries, it's been invaded by crusaders, Ottomans, mercenaries, pirates, and Franks. The Nazis had their eyes on it, too. The 2,000 monks attribute their survival, not surprisingly, to divine intervention. But they've also been pretty crafty. Some of the measures they've taken will surprise you. If you'd like to come for a visit, though, it can be arranged, but... It's not easy. First, you'll need a visa issued by the monks. And unless you're an Orthodox pilgrim, it can take a while. Next, you'll fly to Athens and make your way to a scruffy little town in northern Greece where there's no airport and where the roads are dicey. Then you'll hop on a ferry, unless the trip has been canceled because of rough seas. That happens all the time. But on a calm day, 
it can be a very pleasant ride. The story will continue in a moment. The monks will tell you it takes years of prayer and soul searching before they're ready to leave the world for Mount Athos. For the likes of us, though, it takes a little more than an hour. It was the beginning of Lent when we took these pictures, and the ferry was packed with pilgrims from all over the Orthodox Christian world. Greeks, Bulgarians, Serbs, Romanians, Russians. It wasn't long before the first monasteries came into view, and we thought we were sailing to Byzantium, to a fantasy land of castles and palaces. We were headed for Vatopevi, one of the oldest and largest monasteries on Mount Athos. It had the feel of a medieval city. Holiness seemed to seep from the very stones, from the frescoes on the 10th century church, from the marble font for holy water. But then there was the monastery's secular-looking centerpiece. There's nothing remarkable about the clock tower at the Vado Petty Monastery, except for one thing. Check out the time. It's just about 8.30. Now, my watch reads 2.30. That's a six-hour difference, and there's nothing wrong with their clock or with my watch. It's because the monks on Mount Athos keep Byzantine time. The day starts at sunset, not at midnight. The monks measure time this way during the days of the Byzantine Empire. That's the Christian Empire that followed the fall of Rome, and that's the flag they still fly here. How long ago did the Byzantine Empire fall? 1453. 1453. That's a well-known fact. Well, it wasn't to us. But to Father Serapion, 1453 is the day before yesterday. This peninsula is the only place in the world that still keeps Byzantine time. It has maintained this time for some 550 years. It was harvest time when we arrived, and dozens of monks were hard at work in the olive groves on the hills overlooking the monastery. That's where we ran into Father Nikandros from Melbourne, Australia. This place looks like a, like a summer resort, like a holiday resort, like a, holiday, sure like a, like a retreat, uh -huh. but it's not. It's an arena. It's an arena? Yes. What do you mean the it's unseen an warfare. Unseen warfare? That's right. What does that mean? To fight against the angels of the dark side, you see? Of the demon, of, of the devil, the, the Satan. The battle against Satan and the dark side is waged here every day. The spiritual leader at Vatopedi is Abbot Afrem. Here, the life of Christ is experienced in a genuine way. And this doesn't happen in many other places in the world. What I'm talking about is the art of salvation. It just so happened that while we were there, the monks celebrated an elaborate seven-hour vigil, and the church was packed with pilgrims. It's held once a year to honor the archangels Gabriel and Michael. According to the Bible, Gabriel and Michael led the army of angels that expelled Satan from heaven. The church's relics are brought out every day, and pilgrims ask for the blessing of the saints. The most sacred relic on the entire peninsula is in this case, fabric said to be part of a garment worn by the Virgin Mary. The irony is that while the Mother of God is revered here, no other woman is permitted to even set foot on Mount Athos. It's been like that for a thousand years. The reason, according to Orthodox doctrine, is that Christ gave the peninsula to his mother, and all other women have been excluded so as to fully honor the Virgin Mary. It's also been said that in the days before the ban, when women did come here, the monks became distracted and couldn't devote themselves entirely to prayer. 
They say it's been a lot easier since the last lady left. Keeping women out certainly wasn't much of a problem three, four hundred years ago. Do you feel that's becoming problematic today? I don't think so, because the monastery itself and all the land around it is our property. And if we don't want women coming onto our property, we have every right to do that. Mount Athos may be the last all-male bastion in the world, and Father Arsenio says it has to stay that way. Here we are concerned solely with purity and our elevation to eternity. If women are permitted, they bring their families and their children. This place would become a tourist attraction and no longer a place of silence. If we wanted to experience profound silence, we're advised to go to Stavronikita. It's the smallest monastery on the holy mountain, but it has some of the most remarkable treasures. You stay in the silence just by walking in. There's no electricity here, so the icons and mosaics are illuminated only by shafts of sunlight and a few candles. St. Nicholas, the patron saint, John the Baptist, and the Virgin Mary. We were stunned by the magnificence of the art here, but then we ran into Father Maximus, a former professor at the Harvard Divinity School. He told us what we were seeing cannot be described as art. They're devotional objects, and they're part of the living liturgical life of the church. So we don't have any art, and we're not a museum. I mean, to, to put it starkly. Whatever you call it, it's priceless. That's why the monasteries have been invaded and plundered so many times over the centuries. The monks' most recent brush with history happened only 70 years ago. The Nazis were coming their way. In the spring of 1941, the Germans invaded and occupied uh, uh, Greece. They marched up the Acropolis, raised the swastika beside the Parthenon, and were about to invade. The monks asked for a meeting with Nazi officers who advised them to appeal to Hitler himself. And the monks wrote a letter to Hitler. A letter was written, and uh, in the letter the monks uh, uh, identified themselves. They said, this is who we are. And they asked Hitler to place uh, the holy mountain under his personal protection. What kind of response did you get? Well, uh, it seems that uh, Hitler liked the idea and uh, uh, accepted the invitation to become the personal protector uh, of the holy mountain. Well, l let me just get that yeah. straight. Hitler, the personal protector of the holy mountain. That's right. That's right. Hitler did send a team of German academics to Mount Athos. They took 1,800 pictures of the mountain's treasures, and it wasn't because they enjoyed photography. Hitler wanted the monastery's riches in Berlin. The professors were sent as an advance team to catalog the treasures of the Holy Mountains so that a selection of things could be made to be removed. Didn't happen, did it? Uh, no, it didn't. Not a single thing was taken. Father Maximus believes they have the Russians to thank for that, that by the time the Nazi scholars completed their work, Hitler was bogged down in Russia and wasn't thinking about icons. That Nazi period has been largely forgotten here. To the monks, it was just one more blip on the road, and a small one at that. Today, Vatopedi is the most popular destination on the mountain. It hosts 35,000 pilgrims a year and offers more than spiritual sustenance. The monks have their own fishing boats and the catch is pretty good. The fish are served fresher than in any Greek restaurant. The refectory dates from the 12th century, and since the 12th century, the food here has been free. Vatopedi has been supported by rich benefactors, emperors, princes, kings, and today, partially by pilgrims with deep pockets who commission icons in the making. But the ancient treasures? Not a chance. They can't even see them. They're under lock and key. It's not a new security system, but it works. Normally, it takes more than one monk to unlock the door, because no one monk is allowed to have all four keys at the same time. It's sort of a medieval version of the nuclear launch control. 
Do you keep those keys in your pocket, Father? We try not to. Father Matthew from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, was given the abbot's blessing to let us into the inner sanctum. Once inside, there was still another hidden door. Behind the curtain. <laughs> we walked into the world of Byzantium. It was hard to imagine that everything here was at least 600 years old, because the brilliance had not faded. There are almost 4,000 icons stored in this monastery alone. Oh, wow. The highlight? A 14th century icon of Christ. Every monk will tell you the sole purpose of life on Mount Athos is to get closer to Christ every day. And they say total union with Christ is only possible when they leave this world. The first thing a monk does is embrace and love death. Embrace and love death. Because death is the ticket to the other life. Without a ticket, you can't travel. Where do you get the ticket? In this life. That's what we do each day. We prepare for death. And we are joyful about our journey to heaven. Father Matthew offered to take us to the transit point between this world and heaven. When a monk dies, he's buried until there's nothing left but bones. Then he's brought to where every monk who's ever lived here ends up, the ossuary. Any idea how many skulls there are here? Thousands, I'm not sure how many thousands. Any idea how far they go back? The ones here would be to the 16th century. When you look at the ossuary, what comes to mind? Mostly I see that uh, this is where I'm going to be. I always like to say these are my future roommates. <laughs> there was nowhere for us to go from there. So we headed back to the mainland. The monks invited us to come back any time. And if we do, or if our grandsons or great-grandsons do, after ten days here, this much we believe. Mount Athos will not have changed at all. Go to 60minutesovertime.com to see the challenges of scaling and shooting a story on Mount Athos. Sixty minutes overtime. <laughs> It is overwhelming when you go there. You, all of a sudden you see this monastery rising up into the heavens. You're looking at the backs of birds because you're so high up. It's all designed to remind the monks about being as close to God as one can get on this earth. For producer Michael Karzis, the Mount Athos story was a sort of homecoming. What did it mean to you personally to, to go there? It was incredibly special. It was like a little gift. The son of Greek immigrants, Michael not only speaks the language, he was raised in the Greek Orthodox faith. That came in handy one day when the 60 Minutes crew was about to make a serious error. We wanted to set up an interview with one of the abbots at Vatopedi, and the abbot said, you know, yeah, we could do it in the main church. And I said, okay, well, we can set up there, but we can't set up in the center of the church. Why did I know that? I don't know why I knew that, but it is, it's a sacred place. It's the center of the, of the universe. It's the center of their devotion. They really did do an extraordinary thing by allowing us to come and film in Mount Athos. Well, this is for clear. It's an instant walking stick, thanks to um, Pater Avergios. Thank you, Pater. You're very welcome, uh -huh. Michael. <laughs> you create like a little bit of uh, extracurricular bond with some of these people that you wouldn't otherwise have doing another story or regular story with 60 Minutes. Pater Mazarios. No, let you tell Father Martharios is the gardener that I met in May when I came for the first time on the reporting trip and I was just so impressed. I mean impressed is an understatement. This garden that he tends to is 
you know, maybe has six or seven tiers. It's this unbelievable, like, Babylonian hanging garden. It's amazing to see. And I had this great conversation with him. The oil spill in the Gulf had just happened, and I was telling him about it. And you realize how, um, how cut off they really are. You could see that he was so connected to the environment. He was really affected by it. I mean, he was, he was really disturbed. And I love to garden as well. When I came back, I thought consciously, I thought, well, I'm going to bring him back some seeds of this tomato plant that I've been growing for years and love. These are big tomatoes, very big tomatoes that I, I grew in the summer and I saved the seeds for this. All he said to me, he says, listen, as long as they're not gen genetically modified seeds, I'll take them. I think of him often because he was just a really, really lovely man. On Mount Athos, Michael and the crew had to learn to live pretty much the way the monks live. We only get two meals a day, and there's a brief service just before the first meal at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And then there's a second meal right about now after Vespers, which of course I'm late for. They closed the front door and the meal had started, um, and so I tried to come around the side door. If you could get in there, Chris, you see that basically these are all the pilgrims that have come. You're supposed to have this meal in complete silence. There's one monk that reads stories of saints, stories of saint monks that have basically been martyred over the centuries. So I'm going to go in now because I'm starving. It's like a service. You can't come in late and sort of say, pardon me, but you know, can you slide down and let me have a seat next to you? It's not a good idea to do that. And so if you miss the meal, you miss the meal. Let's go. Now, because of overtime, I'm stuck out here while dinner's being served. We only get two meals a day. It's because they knew that we were working they made some accommodation for us afterwards. What's it been like having us around for the last three or four days? Well, it's certainly a challenge because we're normally shy of cameras. Uh, I hope it hasn't been uh, too much of a, a penance for you. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you. You're on their clock. You're on their turf. There's nothing that you're going to do that's going to change how they live their life. I mean, there have been many other people, a lot more powerful than 60 Minutes, that shown up there and they've carried on, be it the Ottomans, be it the, the Nazis, be it the, the Franks, be it the, you know, I mean, a lot of people have come and gone, you know. Monks, for the most part, are praying all the time. It's like a blast furnace for prayer for the rest of the world, you know? I mean, that's the way it sort of comes across when you spend time there. Yeah. While you and I are going about our, our business Monday to Saturday, they're picking up the prayer for us while we're paying the rent and, 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 and taking the kids to school. That's sort of how they see it. I'll probably go back there. There's more there for me if I can go without having to sort of be consumed with writing questions and making sure we're shooting and all the things that go into making a 60 Minutes piece. I think it's a big responsibility for all of us to get it right. They're trusting us. We don't want to get it wrong. You know, and of course there's the whole spirituality thing. I mean, these guys are, you know, they're monks, you know. They're either going to give you a good recommendation or a bad recommendation. To who? I don't know. I mean, you know. 